Okay, welcome to this um, video podcast about revision for the Unit C6 Global Challenges. So the first thing you're going to need is this uh, A3 sheet, which takes you through all the different areas that uh, C6 covers. And you can get this on the, on the BLE, and I'll also put a link in the video description below. So if you print this out on A3, then you can fill in all the little bits as we go. So we're going to start by looking at metals over here. I'm going to zoom in a little bit, uh, and the unit covers the extraction of different metals and why they have to be extracted in different ways. So to start with, we need to look at the reactivity series over here. Uh, and the first thing is that this shows decreasing metal reactivity as we go down this side here. Now, metals that are very unreactive are just found as elements. So things like silver, gold, and platinum. We just find them lying around, not as compounds. And then the next set of elements uh, are the ones from copper up to zinc. Now these elements are less reactive than carbon, which means we can um, get them from their ores by reduction with carbon. So that's a chemical reaction where carbon takes away the oxygen uh, from the from the compound. And then for metals that are less reactive than car sorry, more reactive than carbon, these ones up here, sodium, magnesium, calcium, and aluminium, we have to use electrolysis to get these uh, metals from their compounds. So let's look at reduction first. So um, one example of reduction is the blast furnace. So this is a blast furnace over here. Basically, it's a really, really large furnace uh, where we put three raw materials into the furnace. We put iron oxide. Um, which is kind of a purified version of iron ore, comes from the ore called hematite, and that's Fe2O3, so two iron atom, sorry, two iron ions and three oxygen ions. Then we also have coke, which is a powdered form of carbon, kind of like powdered charcoal, and we also have limestone, which is calcium carbonate. So we put all those into the furnace. And in the furnace, what happens is carbon reacts with oxygen to produce carbon monoxide, CO. So not CO2, but CO. That carbon monoxide acts as a reducing agent, which means that it can take away the oxygen from the iron oxide, leaving molten iron that is produced. So um, the overall equation for that process is shown here. Uh, so carbon monoxide plus iron oxide goes to carbon dioxide plus Fe, and I've added these red uh, numbers here to balance that equation. There's one other thing going on there in this blast furnace is that limestone is added, and it reacts with impurities in the iron ore to produce something called slag, uh, which is also separated off. Okay, so that's reduction, but there's another process called electrolysis, which is for metals that are more reactive than carbon. So what happens in electrolysis? Well, the first thing you need to know about electrolysis is you have to melt the compound. You have to make the aluminium oxide or molten. Uh, so that requires a lot of energy. You have to heat it up a lot. And also we dissolve it in something called cryolite, molten cryolite, which slightly makes that a bit of an easier process. So what happens? Um, well, first of all, as I said, we have to use this method for metals that are more reactive than carbon. And there's two things really that are going on. First of all, at the anode, the ions, the oxygen two minus ions, they move to the anode because it's positive. Um, and when they get there, those oxygen ions um, get, get rid of their electrons. They give their electrons away to the positive anode. The positive anode takes them in. So we can draw, uh, we can write a half equation, which is this. So 2O2 minus goes to oxygen gas plus 4 electrons. Those four electrons go off into the cathode, they go into this carbon cathode, uh, sorry, off into the anode up there, and they sort of go down this wire. So what happens at the cathode, which is the negative electrode? So the outside of this um, reaction vessel is negatively charged. That's the cathode. So at the cathode, it's the aluminium ions move to the cathode. They are Al3 plus ions. And when they get there, they need to pick up some electrons to be reduced. So they're aluminium 3 plus ions, so they pick up um, three electrons and they form aluminium metal, and that's called reduction. So this process requires the aluminium oxide to be molten, and that's so that the ions can move freely past each other. If it was solid, the ions are in a fixed position. So that's metals. Let's move on and look at another part of this sheet. Now we're going to look down in this bottom left-hand corner. So in the bottom left-hand corner, we're really talking about new extraction technologies. Apologies for my handwriting there. Uh, I'm just still getting used to this new tablet that I've got. 
So new extraction technologies, and I tried to show you here that this is because the price of um, things like copper are going up. So with the price of copper going up, these new extraction technologies are needed. It's also because there's more and more low-grade ore, because the high-grade ores have kind of already been used up, basically. So the two major technologies that we need to look at are phytomining uh, and bioleaching. Spider mining is pretty simple, really. It's just plants uh, taking up the metal ions in roots and then concentrating them uh, in the tissues of the plant, in the leaves of the plant, for example. Now, plants can be then burned uh, to make ash, uh, and then the, the metals are, is in the ash, so then we can extract the metal from the ash. Bioleaching um, uses bacteria, so that's a major difference. And what the bacteria do is they somehow get some energy from kind of eating the ore, uh, they actually break the chemical bonds in the, in the ore, releasing the metal ions. And when they do that, these metal ions can then be um, passed out into solution and then we can use electrolysis to purify. And I've put that in red there because electrolysis may be used to purify both the ash from phyto mining or the kind of what's called the leachate, which is the solution produced by bioleaching. The other thing, instead of mining new metals and getting them out of the ground, we can of course recycle metals. So when we recycle metals, really we have to first of all collect and sort the material, so sorting into plastics and different metals like aluminium and uh, steel. Then we have to melt the metal or plastic by, sorry that should be by heating, so we melt it until it's a uh, liquid and then we can <coughs> reform it by pouring it into a mould and forming a new product, so that's recycling. Um, also remember, and we haven't, we're not going to go into great detail, but there is something called an LCA, which stands for a Life Cycle Assessment, which kind of um, looks at a product and says where in this product's uh, life cycle, whether it's the creation, the maintenance, the repair, or the disposal, where um, does the product require the most energy or create the most carbon dioxide, for example. Okay, so that's pretty much everything on metals. The other global challenge that we're going to look at is oil. And hydrocarbons. So now we're moving up into this uh, top right part of the sheet. So oil is a mixture of hydrocarbons and I, I do realize I've forgotten an R right here so this should be hydrocarbon. Oil is a mixture of hydrocarbons mainly those hydrocarbons are alkanes and because it's a mixture we need to separate them by something called fractional distillation which we'll look at here. So crude oil is a mixture of these hydrocarbons uh, and we have to separate the molecules to make it more useful. So this is a sort of representation. We can see molecules of different lengths, different sizes, and that's what crude oil would be like if you could see the molecules. Now, most of those molecules are called alkanes, and alkanes are a type of hydrocarbon that, we've, that forms a homologous series. So all the alkanes follow a similar pattern, and that means that if they have N carbon atoms, then they've got 2N plus 2 hydrogen atoms. And they also all contain single bonds. And here's one up here. This is a hydrocarbon which has the formula C3H8. And this one down here is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. This is C6H14. So that would be called um, you think called propane. And this one would be called, with six carbons, that is hexane. Right. So how do we separate those alkanes? Well, we separate them by fractional distillation, which is shown here. In fractional distillation, we've got a uh, fractional distillation column, basically a tower. And the furnace is down here, so it's hotter down here, and it's cooler up here. And that's important because in fractional distillation, we separate different alkanes according to their boiling point. So we put the alkanes in the furnace here. They all turn into a gas. As they turn into a gas, they rise up the tower. But the ones which have a l lower, sorry, higher, ones that have a higher boiling point, they won't rise as far because they'll rise up a little bit and then they'll turn back into a liquid and they'll condense and they'll drain off to the side. The ones with a lower boiling point, the, the, the shorter, mole shorter molecules, they will sort of um, go up the tower uh, and get close to the top. In the end, we get a separation of it like this. So here you can see that things like refinery gas, which has a boiling point of only 20 degrees C, comes out the top. Um, you know, things like diesel and petrol are somewhere in the middle. Fuel oil for ships and things like that is towards the bottom, and this has been slightly cut off. This is, say, uh, bitumen, B-I-T-U-M-E-N, uh, which is used for, like, uh, tar on the roads and asphalt and stuff. It's not very useful. So 
Overall, we say that the larger hydrocarbons are more viscous, which means they're more sort of gloopy, um, they're less flammable, and they're also less useful. Okay. Now there's a problem, and the problem with the alkanes is the fact that the supply of the alkanes, what we get in crude oil, is like this. And this large fraction here is mainly <coughs> residue, so that's fuel oil and bitumen. Those are really, really long hydrocarbon molecules, and they're not really good for very much. But what we want, the demand, what industry needs, is things like mainly petrol, this fraction down here, and stuff like gas oil, so shorter molecules. So how do we go from large molecules to short molecules? The answer uh, is cracking. So there's cracking is a process, uh, it's quite simple really, it's just taking a long molecule and breaking it in two, um, or two or three pieces. Um, and we do that with this, we can do that in the, in the lab to demonstrate with this apparatus here. In industry it's much bigger, uh, it's called an oil refinery, but in the lab we do it with this kind of apparatus. So here's the apparatus. First of all we have our mineral wool soaked in paraffin over here. Uh, and that paraffin is in hydrocarbon, so it's a kind of quite long hydrocarbon molecule uh, which is soaked over here. Then we have a catalyst, and quite often we use broken pottery, sometimes I think you can use aluminium oxide, and that's the catalyst in the middle. We heat the catalyst really strongly, so it's kind of almost red hot. And then, once we've done that, we can kind of heat the wool, sorry, the, the mineral wool. So that paraffin there, the hydrocarbon, then becomes a vapour, kind of wafts across and it lands here on the catalyst, and when it does so, it breaks. As it breaks, shorter hydrocarbons are formed, which may, for example, be gases, and the gas can be collected underwater like this, so it bubbles up through here. So here's an example of a cracking reaction. Here we have a longer hydrocarbon, and we can see this is the point here where it kind of breaks. So this molecule lands on the catalyst, breaks at this point. When we break it, we can't add any hydrogen atoms or carbon atoms, we can't take any away. So the numbers on the left has to equal the numbers on the right. So here's a little uh, puzzle for you. How many carbons and hydrogens are there here? You can count them, fill this in. How many here and how many here? You can pause the video for a second, work it out, and then see if you're right. Okay, here we go. So there are, uh, the molecule on the left is C8H18, so that would be something called octane. And then on the right, we produce two different molecules, C6H14, which is called hexane. And this is something different. So this is not an alkane, because remember an alkane has the formula CnH2n plus 2. So that's not an alkane. Triple scientist, that is an alkene, and it's called ethene. So overall, the other thing we need to know about this reaction is it's an example of a thermal decomposition reaction, uh, and a catalyst makes it happen. Okay, so that's oil. Moving on to the last part of our global challenges is kind of about uh, our air and our water. So our, basically our atmosphere. So if we look down here in the bottom right hand corner, first thing we're going to look at is what is the air? What's in it? Okay, The air, we can look at this pie chart, I slightly enlarged it here, is actually 78% nitrogen. That's an inert gas. That's N2 if you want to shorten that. 21% oxygen or O2. Argon is a noble gas, it's almost 1%. Carbon dioxide, this is only a small amount. Uh, it's 0.04%, but that, that number is rising. And then we've got very small amounts of other gases, like trace gases, for example, water vapour. So, how did this atmosphere get here? Um, well, the planet is around about um, 4 billion years old, and early in its history, it was very volcanic. There were volcanoes, and they were releasing carbon dioxide and water uh, when they erupted. Over time, this carbon dioxide and water formed the atmosphere and eventually there was enough water for it to condense uh, to form the oceans uh, and then we had the evolution of life. This took quite a long time but once life evolved tiny little bacteria started to uh, to grow and one of the things they did was they did photosynthesis. So with the bacteria doing photosynthesis oxygen levels rose they rose high enough to form an ozone layer around the earth which kind of protected us from UV rays and then what happened was there was enough oxygen produced that uh, animals and things evolved later on. Today, we are messing up the atmosphere by basically burning fossil fuels, burning those hydrocarbons that we just looked at. That produces carbon dioxide. Here we've got a graph that shows carbon dioxide concentration 
uh, and then the years before present. Okay, so carbon dioxide levels have fluctuated. This is actually taken from an old past paper, uh, and they have fluctuated. They went up, and they went down, and then they went up again. But today, CO2 levels have never been higher. So they're close to now what we say is 400 parts per million up here. Um, and that's never been recorded in the history of the Earth. Okay, so that's extremely, extremely high. And it's problematic because it's causing the greenhouse effect and global warming. So what is this greenhouse effect? How does it work? Well, the greenhouse effect can be summarized like this. First of all, the sun heats the Earth. So the surface of the Earth heats up, and like any hot object, the Earth emits infrared radiation. So this infrared radiation is then uh, emitted and sort of sent out towards space. Now normally if you look here, some of it gets out into space, but the greenhouse gas layer, which is kind of sort of here, if you see where the arrow is, um, absorbs and reflects the infrared radiation back to Earth. So that's this sort of arrow uh, shown here, reflecting back to Earth. And basically the more CO2 and other greenhouse gases, the hotter we get. So other greenhouse gases that we didn't put on this uh, PowerPoint here include methane, which is actually, I think, something like seven or eight times more powerful than carbon dioxide. So that's quite serious. So that's the atmosphere. What about water? Final kind of global challenge is supplying fresh water to the growing population. So water is over in this box. So First of all, where do we get water from? Well, we can get it from lakes, rivers, reservoirs. Uh, two words that you may not be familiar with is an aquifer. An aquifer is actually what's shown in this diagram here. It's an underground water store. So here we can sort of see layers of rock. There's a surface river, but there's layers of rock. And then down there, stored in porous rock underground, is water called an aquifer. So we can also get water from the sea, but the problem with the sea is that it's very salty. So to produce drinking water from the sea, we have to do something called desalination which is removing salt from seawater. And that takes a lot of energy. So typically it's only done in places where there's a lot of, um, for example, sunlight. So for example, in uh, some Middle Eastern countries, they have uh, quite a lot of water, like in Dubai, via desalination, because they have plentiful access to sort of solar power. Whereas in the UK, not so much. Uh, in the UK, we do treat our water, as do lots of um, all countries, pretty much. So how do we treat water, waste water? Well, first thing, We've got to filter it, we've got to filter out the large debris, like if we're getting it from a lake, we want to filter out the leaves and the branches and stuff like that. Then there's a process of settlement, so that occurring in these two stages here, where basically any sediment that's in the water kind of is allowed to really sink down, so we just take the water from the top. Eventually, once it's clear enough, we add chlorine, so chlorine will kill any bacteria that are present in the water and viruses. And then some governments, not all, some governments actually add something called fluoride, which can be, uh, it's controversial, uh, and, uh, but it can improve sort of dental health. It improves the sort of enamel on your teeth. Uh, so that's water. So that's pretty much the, the total of C6. Uh, I'll just zoom out there. So that's everything we've covered. Just very briefly in summary, we looked at um, metals over here and the challenges of how to get metals. Um, one word we didn't use there is just an ore. So remember an ore is any um, compound or, or rock that contains enough of the metal compound to make it sensible to mine. Uh, and we also talked about new technologies for mining and also recycling. Then we moved on to talk about hydrocarbons and everything to do with those. We said that oil is a hydrocarbon, a mixture of hydrocarbons. We use fractional distillation to kind of separate the molecules and make them more uh, make them more useful, but there's a problem in that we get a lot of supply of longer hydrocarbons and we want shorter hydrocarbons. To get around this problem, we take the long ones and we break them by a process called cracking into shorter molecules. Burning all these fossil fuels, these hydrocarbons like diesel and petrol, causes a problem though because it produces more carbon dioxide um, which contributes to the greenhouse effect, changing our atmosphere which has taken millions, sorry, billions of years to produce. Finally, water. We looked at where do we get it from and the treatment uh, to produce drinking water. So that's the whole of C6. I hope you've um, enjoyed this video uh, and do come and find me if you have any questions. Thanks.